I'm Simon Higgins, speaking from Guilin, China, and it's my great honor to be the author of the forthcoming historical adventure, Dragons of Dusk and Dawn. Humans need continuity. It's that old story. Where did you come from? What are you made of? Who do you think you are? A DNA test in 2018 answered many of those questions for me, and also that ancestral DNA test opened my eyes to a couple of unknown elements of my family's genetic background that inadvertently inspired dragons of dusk and dawn. I already knew that my family had English, Irish, Scottish, and French genes all mixed up in the soup, so to speak. But the 2018 DNA test also surprised me by revealing that I had a considerable amount of Scandinavian and also Asian DNA. On learning this, I felt it immediately explained many of my lifelong interests, drives, passions, and no doubt Aristotle was correct in saying that we are more than the sum of our parts. But it certainly became a journey of self-discovery that I decided to, in a way, write about. What would happen if there was some kind of confrontation between the Scandinavian ancestors and the Asian ancestors? Martial arts training, and in particular training with exotic weapons, has been a part of my life since I was 16 years old. It's kept me fit and healthy over the years, taken me to faraway lands to enter into interesting competitions where I've learned as much about culture as I have about fighting. And it's also kept me safe during a decade in law enforcement. One of the wonderful things about martial arts is that it truly is applicable in a very scientific way to storytelling. I've worked hard over the years to make sure that in all my novels, fight scenes between individuals and also battle scenes are accurate to history and also practical in terms of they really do work. In Dragons of Dusk and Dawn, naturally the same has applied. And there's another level to Dragons of Dusk and Dawn, and that's the exploration of Sun Tzu's, or Sun Tzu's art of war. The fascinating science of making war and defensive warfare from thousands of years ago in China. Alongside this, its cousin science, Modzi's, or Modzi's, defensive strategy system the way in which a peaceful, benign culture can simply defend itself, not be the aggressor, but protect its fortress or its city when coming under attack. Hui, one of the main characters of Dragons of Dusk and Dawn, is an expert in the theory of both of these sciences, Sun Tzu and Modzi. The challenge, of course, for him, that the reader follows him into, is applying them in lethal real life. The elements of Dragons of Dusk and Dawn as a novel concern the collision of three cultures. Not only the collision of the people physically, their forces, their explorers and so on, but also the collision of their philosophies, their ways of life and their varying stages of advancement, their varying stages of literacy, their different aspects of cosmological folklore or religious belief, and also their varying degrees of science as opposed to superstition. Communication between cultures relies on that which is found to be held in common. Language, symbols, ideals and ideas. But it also revolves around differences and the individual culture's sense of appropriateness, honor, obligation or hospitality. Even today, China is dotted with evidence of the majestic Tang Dynasty. At the time that Europe was in what is now known as the Dark Ages, the Tang capital, Chang'an, was the vastest and most cosmopolitan city in the world, with ambassadors, with representatives from multiple nations living there and interacting with the rulers. Hui, the young scholar who is the chief protagonist, and at the center of the story of Dragons of Dusk and Dawn is a product of the mighty Tang Dynasty, intellectual, scientifically advanced, and very open to the exploration of the world.
Einar, or if we want to use the correct Nordic tones, Einar, is the young and dynamic Viking raid chief leader, the antagonist of Dragons of Dusk and Dawn. His people, who had already mastered traveling the seas and designing amazing longships, the legendary and fearsome dragon boats, had worked out that river systems like this enabled them to penetrate deep into foreign lands. They moved into the east, down the rivers of Russia. The name Rus actually relates to the Viking overlords who established a powerful rulership in Russia in medieval times. And of course, their eyes were on the west, on the Anglo-Christian kingdoms, vulnerable and filled with, in their minds at least, treasure, the opportunity for plunder, and the chance, according to their own culture, to invest themselves in the songs of men and the feasting halls of the gods. All throughout history, there truly have been warrior women. Notable examples include Queen Boudicca of the Celts, known to her Roman adversaries as Boadicea, Frances Jeanne d'Arc, Joan of Arc, the virgin warrior who took on the English invaders and their Burgundian allies on behalf of her Dauphin, and China's Hua Mulan, the now iconic maiden who disguised herself as a man in order to take her father's place when the call of conscription came to their tiny village. After fighting against a savage northern enemy, Mulan refused rewards from the emperor in favor of going home to care for her aging parents. Out of the same mold comes Irsa in Dragons of Dusk and Dawn, also fighting in her way for her people and recognized even in her own young lifetime as a potential shield maiden of legend, someone whose courage, ferocity, and intelligence in raids and battles sets her up to potentially enter the sagas, the long stories told over and over again during the even longer cold nights that the Viking people endured. Lady Elvia of Stonekeep is the western flip side of Hue, a remarkable young woman who has used her position as the daughter of her small country's famous and fearsome general, her relationship with the open-minded and visionary king, and her raw courage and intelligence to cunningly rise to an anointed position of something extremely rare in her culture, a girl scholar. Did such young women really exist back in history? Yes, indeed. Notable examples include Britain's Lady of Mercia and France's Eleanor of Aquitaine, who not only mastered falconry, Latin, mathematics, but ultimately rose to not only be the ruler of France, but also of England. Since ancient times, lions have been the symbol of royalty and nobility, emblematic of many noble houses and many kings who supposedly were ferocious in battle, but wise and gentle carers for their people. The reality, of course, has often been blood-spattered pages of history, streaked with cruelty and dictatorship. However, in Dragons of Dusk and Dawn, there truly is a wise and sentient king. Audentius, master of Stonekeep and ruler of a small Anglo-Christian kingdom under attack by the Vikings, is an outstanding individual and a character who reflects historical figures such as Alfred the Great. Raised by a warrior scholar father, Audentius admires the civilization left behind by the Romans and looks forward to possible first contact with a brand new civilization, a high empire from the east, the mighty tongue. Unique exotic warriors have always fired the human imagination. Like China's General Fubo, still respected to this day, an intellectual, a very literary man, but also a fighter, whose deeds in battle could only be described as the stuff of superhero legend. And from the Scandinavian lands came the berserkers, usually huge, powerful men wearing animal skins, often bear cloaks and bear headdresses, who were the shock troops of the Vikings in raids and sieges. 
Berserkers rushed into battle, sometimes stripped to the waist, oblivious of the spears and arrows and blades that would come at their exposed flesh. Such a fearless individual is Thralls. Also, if we want to use the correct Nordic terms, called Trolls. Given to young Einar as a mentor by his father, Frode the Wise. Given to him to prepare him, school him, and lead him to glory in the West. The climax of Dragons of Dusk and Dawn comprises a siege, the Siege of Stonekeep. In ancient and medieval times, to attack a fortress or a walled city, to defend it, this was the very stuff that survival and life was often made of. One of the things the book explores is not only the physicality of the warfare, the attack and counter thrust of the invading forces and the repelling forces, but also the psychological toll, the psychological warfare and tricks, and the fear and apprehension felt by both sides because of the great consequences should they fail. There are three reasons that the events chronicled in Dragons of Dusk and Dawn could actually have happened. Placing the novel, therefore, not only in the category of alternate history, but also lost history or buried history. Something we know that has happened many, many times across the aeons of human development. The first reason is that the ocean-going technology that existed in the later Ming Dynasty, which successfully took Chinese explorers and ambassadors on a number of adventures to the West, as far as the Middle East and Africa, enabling them to even bring back exotic creatures such as giraffes as gifts for the emperor. We know that technology already existed and was in the hands of Chinese science in the Song and Tang dynasties. Secondly, at the end of the glorious age, referred to as the Tang dynasty, sadly the empire fell. And when it fell, the rebels rising up and destroying it also destroyed its records. They systematically burned and ruined the archives in the capital, Chang'an, which contained all the glorious achievements of the Tang Dynasty up to that point. The third reason the novel could be true is that it would explain why the Chinese crossbow, a sophisticated mechanical weapon, suddenly appeared in Britain and in Europe during the era described in the novel. The Silk Road had existed for a long time before that, and silks and spices, exotic items, had been making their way from east to west, but no Chinese crossbow. And then suddenly, in pretty much one generation, we go from a situation in Britain and Europe where it's all longbows, to the Chinese crossbow, or rather a local adaptation of it, being a standard part of many countries and small kingdoms' arsenals. How did that happen? I wonder if Hui, or someone like him, really had something to do with it. So basically, Dragons of Dusk and Dawn is not only an alternate history, but I say an explanation for something that could be hidden from our sight, buried by the sands of time, but nonetheless true. If you like tales of adventure, exploration, danger, action, and strategy. I hope you'll find all of these, as well as an interesting cast of male and female characters in Dragons of Dusk and Dawn.